I'll tell you what, while we're all getting mic'd so that we don't have too much downtime, um, I will get us started. I'm Ellen Seidman. Uh, I had the privilege of being a visiting scholar at the San Francisco Fed earlier this year and uh, helping to co-edit this book. And this first panel consists of um, three people who know and have been a part of this field for a very, very long time. Uh, they're all Washingtonians. You probably know most, you know one or more of them, uh, but we're going to have a very lively conversation that's going to go beyond what you've heard them say before. So um, we have Peter Edelman, who's the co-director for the Center on Poverty, Inequality, and Public Policy at Georgetown University. Alan Barubi, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution Metropolitan Policy Program, and Sarah Wartell, who is the president of the Urban Institute. And um, the purpose of this panel is to set the stage for the day. Um, and just a reminder, tweet, ask questions on your cards. Um, we actually are going to be interactive. We did this yesterday, and it was very interactive. And I'll bet you can do even better. So with that. Okay? Okay. So, so um, Peter, uh, as you describe in your chapter, which is one of my very favorites in the book, um, you've been part of modern community development from, from the very beginning. Um, and you make the point that even in the 60s, uh, we had this desire for comprehensive solutions. But it was a different kind of thinking about comprehensiveness. What, um, what's similar? from the 60s to today, and what's different about how we're thinking about community development today? Well, I think that um, we want to talk both about what's uh, different in terms of the, what we're doing, and, and, but also the challenges we face and how we've done. Uh, first of all, I just want to say how important this book is. Uh, and. and uh, you know, and, and Nancy and David know, I, I think all of you know, there, there really isn't been this compilation of, of what we know, and a lot of what we know is, is good to guide us. Uh, and what it addresses, the, we have 46 million people in this country uh, who are poor by the kind of inadequate way we measure uh, poverty. Um, but what, what is the toughest poverty and also the most politicized poverty is the persistent uh, and intergenerational poverty, and that in turn is heavily connected to place, uh, both urban and rural, and now increasingly suburban uh, as well. So, so this book is not only uh, on target on this subject, but this is the subject. Uh, we want to end poverty, but, but we, we really need to attack persistent and intergenerational poverty. Uh, we need to be aware uh, that, and this is a part of the answer to your question. I hope everything I say is part of the answer to your question. <laughs> but you never know. <laughs> uh, this has been an uphill battle because uh, we have done a lot uh, that works in public policy to, to ameliorate uh, poverty in general, much less well in relation to, to uh, inner city and, and other parts of persistent and intergenerational. And so uh, even though we're keeping 40 million people out of poverty by Social Security and food stamps and earned income tax credit and, and so on, 46 million people. Uh, and that particularly manifests itself in relation to the communities that we're, we're talking about here, because the efforts to, to do something that pays off with outcomes that reduces the, uh, the, the magnitude of these issues uh, in these communities and neighborhoods, we've been fighting an uphill battle. And that uphill battle is, is twofold, and it's, it's important to keep it in mind uh, if, in a general sense, apart from the terrific examples that we have 
uh, in the book and that we know are out there in Houston and Atlanta uh, and in other uh, places. Uh, one is that the economy uh, is, it's, we've turned into a low wage nation. Uh, and that's uh, important across the board, but it, it has a disproportionate effect on people in these communities. Uh, and the other is uh, that on top of what's happened to our economy in general, globalization and all the rest of it, uh, that uh, we've come to have these tough, knotty uh, problems that manifest itself when we have too many low-income people, too many poor people all living in the same place. Uh, and so we've been uh, fighting uphill against both, both of those things. Uh, there, there are a number of things that I think uh, we have not un understood well enough. If you go back to Bedford-Stuyvesant, we where I had a little little thumbnail or fingernail in uh, helping there, uh, and the, which the book shows us some some people, namely the, the authors of this book, but then others obviously um, understand now, but which we have not understood. Uh, and I think that, that I'll just list them fairly quickly. Uh, number one, how much of uh, these uh, issues that we're dealing with directly uh, in neighborhoods uh, that have such serious issues, are it's heavily influenced from the outside. Uh, and so if we do get wages up it, for people in general, it's going to help build community. There's going to be a stronger economic base uh, uh, in these communities. Uh, so much of what uh, is wrong inside uh, these neighborhoods is uh, you have to have leadership there to make progress, but it comes from outside. It's from forces that uh, we don't do enough about the, the connection. Uh, the school system in general uh, is downtown in terms of the control, et cetera, uh, as well as, as the economy. And of course, uh, that leads to uh, I think a major point that we're finally sort of waking up to, there was, uh, I don't know whether to call it a mythology or a, uh, anyway, a belief uh, at the beginning that we could solve the inner city problems uh, within the four corners uh, of the neighborhood. Uh, I remember so vividly, uh, in, in obviously many in the room know, uh, Robert Kennedy was so excited that we could get his friend Tom Watson to locate an IBM plant uh, in Bedford-Stuyvesant. Like, oh, that's going to be it. You know, nobody will be poor anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, that's a little over the top. But uh, we, it's come to us rather slowly that, it, and you know, it was even largely true then, that the jobs are uh, in the region. And, and you need to figure out, I mean, there's a lot of things, the schooling and the, uh, uh, the job training and the transit for sure, all, all of that that goes into thinking regionally. But uh, I, I have to say it's, it's disappointing how many of the initiatives that we've had uh, around the country over this period of time have not gotten past that, that uh, really naive idea that we can create enough jobs uh, for people who are resident in the neighborhood, essentially within the four corners uh, of the neighborhood. And so we're waking up to that, and I think that's good. Um, thirdly, the, the whole question of, of schools, but more broadly, the whole question of investing uh, in children. Because uh, as Elizabeth Duke says from the very beginning of the book, we now understand this is a combination of people and place, place and people. It's not, it just is all of that. Uh, and you know, you want to say, well, we should have got there, you know, et cetera, but we're, <laughs> we're getting there. Um, and so uh, that's, a, that's the point of Promise Neighborhoods uh, as an as a entry point for um, multidimensional initiatives. And it's also true, I'd say parenthetically, and as the book uh, says, uh, that healthcare more and more, uh, particularly with the Affordable Care Act, is an entry point uh, and an organizing point. 
But um, we absolutely are finally beginning to see uh, people who've been doing good work on housing and on sort of physical uh, aspects of the community uh, over a, a long period of time and have produced tangible numbers of housing units and uh, commercial development that brings in, you know, kind of the spine of stores uh, and all of that. But finally we're seeing people say, oh, we've got a, and, and charters help in this. I don't want to get us into a side debate about charters because that's complicated, but charters do help in this because they're much more uh, flexible uh, uh, to, to get one started. So it's no accident that here in Ward 7, uh, where we have a Promise Neighborhood awarded to, the, with the Cesar Chavez Public Charter School as the anchor, or Jeff Canada's work, uh, that the charters uh, play a key role in that. So uh, getting to the schools and starting with early childhood, and Jack Shonkoff was here to remind us if we needed reminding and all of that, and he's in the book. Uh, the investing in children, as obvious as that is, we're, we're, we're getting around to it now as a, as a key uh, organic, uh, very, very uh, uh, just really important part of what we would do. Is it, that's how you break the cycle. Right. And uh, related to that, th that it is a duplex thing. That's a two, that it's working with the families as well. I mean, you know, it's a, again, one of these things that we all ought to understand, you, you can't do school reform out of poverty by itself. Uh, you can't do anti-poverty without having uh, wonderful public schools. Uh, we've got to have, we've got to have uh, all of that. So uh, we need to be paying attention not only to the poverty and the low incomes of the, of the parents, but uh, sad to say, we've got, to, we've got to deal with some of these embedded things that are there after decades of intergenerational poverty. Uh, where we have uh, parents who have had their kids too young, uh, have had uh, dad isn't around for in many obviously reasons have to do with the way the criminal justice system works. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, one of the things that I think we, we might have done a little better with in, in the book, Ellen, uh, is to face up to these family structure uh, and behavior questions uh, that I think are huge blocks, uh, huge barriers to, to making uh, progress uh, in, in these uh, neighborhoods. And, you know, it's uncomfortable, uh, but the fact is, uh, when I went out to Ward 7 the other day to take a look at our promised neighborhood here in, in Washington, that's very much what it's all about. Very much a two-generation strategy, starting from when the kids are born, home visiting, all kinds of parent participation. In, in there's Educare there, but in uh, the early childhood, in the school, all of that. Uh, so I really need to understand, uh, underscore that. And, and that's a problem that we didn't face up to at all when we started this work in the 1960s. Just a couple more things. Um, We've learned, and, and uh, David Erickson says it so well in the book, uh, and, and I think it's, it's another place where we uh, sort of fell down at the, at the beginning, um, and that is that this only works if there are multiple actors. Uh, all of the different players uh, in the community working together, collective impact, uh, whether we call it a, a quarterback uh, or that's, you know, for the sports fans that works anyway, but, and it's certainly better than lead agency or intermediary <laughs> or, you know, we couldn't have got all those words out there that put you to sleep. Um, and, and so we absolutely need your, your example in the, uh, Nancy, in the, in the, uh, the video of the $80,000 and what that produced in terms of the leverage and, and getting all, and, and you know, listening to what's happening in Houston and Atlanta and so on. It's always... Uh, we've got, got to harness all the actors in the community with all the different uh, responsibilities uh, that they have. Um, we need to be uh, clear, I think, about one of our objectives. And, and uh, this is me, I don't know, but I think people, well, anyway, I think you all ought to agree with me. Uh, <laughs> and, and that is uh, a principle of choice. 
that we've had this debate for a long time about are we building up the neighborhood, are we you know, trying to have everybody move out, what is it? And the answer is both, uh, because many people are very, very tied uh, in appropriate and understandable ways. Uh, to, that's their community. And it's got lots of problems, but it's their community. Uh, at the same time, there are a lot of people who would prefer, if they had the, the chance, and, and who, in their case, will do better uh, if they uh, can get, move in another uh, neighborhood, uh, the asthma might, might go away, et cetera, uh, but lots more things than that. Uh, and we, we, that's not the policy that we're really pursuing in a, in a serious way. And it's, there are political problems about it, but really people ought to have a full choice about where they will live, what will be the community in which they live, and not be penned in somewhere and not be pushed out somewhere, but have a, have a genuine choice. So. And then, uh, finally, I would say with Paul Grogan uh, and Angela Glover back Blackwell that we need conscious policy advocacy. Uh, we need that uh, just in, in a serious, intentional way uh, to do these things and, and to understand, uh, and I think this is, this is clear to all of us, but the federal government, which needs to do more and under this administration was starting to do more, uh, and we hope we'll be able to, but this is so much a challenge to the local community from within the neighborhood and more broadly within the city and more broadly within the metropolitan area and with the state role uh, as well and, and starting with the leadership in the area where people live there and the responsibility, as I said, if everybody lives there, but on out the civic responsibility. So I think that um, since we started, uh, we've had a lot of experience, we've done a lot, but we really have to ask ourselves uh, very, very soberly uh, why we haven't gotten more done. And I think this book helps us. Well, thank you. And uh, it's a really good segue for um, Alan. I'm not going to ask you the question I thought I said I was going to. Um, I, I, <laughs> Uh, because Peter um, <laughs> raises uh, the critical issue that you know community development tends to focus on communities, mm -hmm. but is is that the right focus? And um, should we be thinking more about integrating the communities that we're talking about um, into the broader economy, or is the problem really the broader economy? Mm -hmm. And as um, Clara Miller and um, Angela. Uh, Glover Blackwell talk about in the book, uh, have we gotten to the point where poverty, poor communities are not the exception, but unfortunately too much the rule, and it's our economy that needs to change? Yeah, so thank you, Ellen. I just want to, um, as sort of Peter said at the beginning, I'm really pleased and honored to have been a, a part of this project. I just, it's a little bit of an out-of-body experience to follow Peter Edelman on a panel about <laughs> poverty, so I just want to stipulate that from the outset, so uh, excuse my comments in advance. Um, I, I, uh, I, I think what you're getting at, Ellen, is, uh, is exactly at the core of, I think, what you know, I've been trying to do through, through my work, what a lot of people have been trying to do through their work is sort of understand ex exactly what Peter was talking about, these larger forces that exist outside of the community that are in many ways responsible for the creation of these new communities of poverty that form some of the, the basis for my research, the fact that we actually have more poor people now living in suburbs than these inner city neighborhoods that you know, we're responsible for the, the birth of community development and it, it's, its continued relevance today because, of course, concentrated poverty hasn't gone away, but new poverty is, is cropping up in these places that I think for most community development practitioners would look completely foreign. Uh, through this work we've been doing on suburban poverty at Brookings, we've been visiting communities like um, uh, Antioch in uh, the far eastern Bay Area, so 30, drive 30 miles east of Oakland uh, into you know, what was not too long ago an agricultural community, but uh, is now home to a lot of new single family developments, 
uh, huge foreclosures, voucher holders who had moved out from uh, inner city San Francisco and Oakland in search of the American dream, uh, but there was no economy there. The only economy that was there was building housing and everything that went along with that. When that collapsed, it just left very poor communities in its wake. And this is a, this is a place that doesn't have community development per se. It doesn't have much of anything other than some, some scrappy folks who were doing a little bit of job training there, and now their problems have multiplied tenfold. Um, but you'd find that in this region, if you went out to Prince William County, you'd find it, uh, you know, the suburbs that, that ring, uh, you know, declining regions like Cleveland. Uh, you find it in immigrant enclaves that are south of uh, the city of Seattle, a uh, big uh, portal for refugees. So all of these communities, in a way, are, are, you know, they're not suffering, I would say, from a lack of affordable housing or some of the tools that were really at the, at the heart of, of building communities and trying to rebuild economies in the inner city. Uh, they, are, uh, they are a victim of an economy that's just left a lot of people behind and has not created opportunity for people who don't have uh, the skills that are weighed down by these problems with, with family structure and uh, intergenerational poverty in some cases. Um, so I think the challenge is, uh, and as we visit these communities, of course, none of them say we got an affordable housing problem. They say we have a skills problem. We have a problem with economic connection between our communities and, and the broader opportunities that might exist elsewhere in the region. Um, so, so what is it about the present or the future of community development that's really going to help to tackle these human capital, human resource issues in new ways. Perhaps affordable housing is part of the solution there, but I think we need to challenge ourselves on that. Uh, and, I, and I think we need, to, uh, we need to consider how is community development poised to play in and influence discussions about the shape and the structure of the economy, which I think, you know, I don't think, I don't think the federal government has such a great view on that. I think you know, there are corners that do. These, these discussions are really taking shape at the state level, at the regional level. Um, but I wouldn't say that all community development organizations are necessarily poised or uh, structured in such a way that they can play at the big kids table when regions are figuring out what are we going to focus on, what are we going to try to build here or attract here that's going to not just grow more jobs, but grow better jobs. And we're going to equip the people in these communities uh, with the skills and the human capital uh, to participate in those jobs. Yeah. Uh, so Sarah, how are we going to do that all with fewer federal resources? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let me uh, start with my 30-second um, testament to how important I think this book is. And the word I am using is catalytic. In one sense, it's describing things that everyone in this room has seen their piece of for some time. So each of the chapters, uh, and, and you look at the summary, part of it is, yeah, of course. But in another way, you're giving name and frame and framework uh, to a set of conversations that have been happening amongst people in a way that others outside this world can relate to and take it. And I see how this approach to policy is working in helping to drive how we think about uh, research at the Urban Institute, as I'm driving my colleagues crazy, uh, dri reminding them over and over, and um, e even in the federal government, too. So I, I, I really think this is an important undertaking, and I really applaud City and the San Francisco Fed and Lyft for taking it on. Um, resources. Um, I guess the, just the first thing to say is there will be fewer. Um, there will be a lot fewer. We can get past the fiscal cliff. Um, but the fiscal cliff is simply a action forking, forcing mechanism that does a very bad job of deciding how to close a gap to force people to find another way to uh, figure out how to close a gap. And closing that gap will require inevitably spending less on things that all of us think we spend probably too little on already, um, which means that we have two choices how to deal with that. The traditional Washington way of dealing with that problem is to say, all right, guys, we got you know, uh, 90 cents where we once had a dollar. Uh, let's figure out how to divide the 90 cents up, and I'm going to fight hard with you to make sure that I get 94 and you only get 86. Well, that's constructive. Um, <laughs> and at the end of the day, everybody, uh, you know, if you got 94, you're celebrating. Well, what, what exactly have we gotten done? Um, but we have another, th so the, the into, come into the conversation, there's a new 
uh, focus on evidence and using evidence, uh, making evidence-based policy and deciding who gets 94 and who gets 86 based on whether or not they can prove that they have make an impact. And I welcome the focus on evidence coming from a research-based organization. Um, but we need to think a little bit differently about what that evidence is and how it's developed. The, uh, yes, we have been talking about the importance of the gold standard uh, research uh, proof point, but um, very few people who are trying to solve problems on the ground really want to wait for the Urban Institute to come in and come back 10 years later with a long-term, longitudinal random control trial assignment to tell them whether something was working or not that they probably knew six months in was going to be successful or not. Um, and so we have to start thinking about creating a continuous learning cycle where information comes back into communities so that the people who are doing these things get real-time information uh, that can inform the choices they make. So evidence is hugely important in this fight, but it is uh, a, a different way of thinking about evidence that I think will be a driver. And then the other thing we've got to do is think about how do we make this um, not a moment where you take 90 cents on the dollar and divide it up, but you figure out, well, we've got 90 cents on the dollar in your sector, we've got 90 cents on the dollar in your silo. Well, what if we put those 90 cents together? Now we got 180 instead of two, but the fact is maybe we can make more productive the uh, aggregation of the two. Remember that when you were spending 90 cents on your housing problem, you were frustrated because you couldn't use housing to get to all the social outcomes we thought we wanted to because there were still educational issues or healthcare issues or social service or job employment issues. Well, when you're in the employment sector, you can't solve for the mental health and the physical environment of people in a job training program. Well, what if we're suddenly delivering those services in a coordinated way and maybe then your 180 cents instead of $2 can be more productive. And it really, we have to figure out a way to make this a catalytic moment. And so let me just end by saying that I think that the opportunity for catalyst is not going to be in uh, trying to figure out how Washington can suddenly uh, give its money in dramatically different ways. I don't think we will be the place that does that innovation, unfortunately. I think we can, uh, we're not going to change the structure of congressional committees. We're not going to turn into giant pooled funding going into communities that somebody in town could figure out. But we can develop um, what, I, what, what Peter referred to as the quarterback that uh, is mentioned in Nancy and David's chapter. I like to call it the orchestra conductor. Um, but it's the person who can figure out how to bring those streams together in ways that with evidence that is more, that by coordinating them, you're able to get to better outcomes off a, a number of different measures. And I think we're going to need orchestra conductors at a variety of different levels. We need it in community, and it, ultimately this is bottom up. This has to be driven by the needs of a community. But we also need it, as Alan's talked about, at the regional level, where there are people thinking about problems beyond any one particular community that are essential to figuring out what makes something in that community work. And we need it at the federal level, where there's someone who can help at least, be, um, we start talking about instead of busting silos, because we'll all be very old before that ever happens, but maybe piercing silos and adding some flexibility between the different programmatic outcomes. Um, so if we can come up with a way that we can uh, coordinate and make beautiful music of all of these different um, uh, initiatives, maybe our, this will be our um, you know, uh, transformative moment where we'll actually leapfrog, take advantage of the adversity to actually get to something that uh, leapfrogs and is uh, much more effective with our scarcer resources. Great. Now, I want to remind all of you to um, put your questions down and raise your hand so someone will come pick them up. And if you are watching online, or frankly, if you're in the audience and like to tweet, you can uh, tweet on hashtag what works. Um, you know, one thing that uh, we had sort of a difficulty with several times in, this, in, this, in the process of writing the book is sort of what's the focus. And uh, semantics uh, can be really important. And for a lot of people who work in low-income communities, um, they've often felt that the word economic development is code for let's fix up downtown and ignore everyone else, or for gentrification. So now we're saying we need to get beyond communities 
we're saying we need economic development for jobs and incomes, how do we avoid falling into the old traps? Anyone want to start? Uh, well, I don't see anything wrong with the word community as, as long as we, uh, I mean, compared to, to the, uh, economic development is, is too narrow, as we already said. And so we, we need language that talks about this in its completely three-dimensional way. Um, you know, when you uh, asked Alan about the outside things, and, he, and Alan, you talked about these, the, the, the new uh, communities that have issues as, as neighborhoods or communities, uh, uh, I, I would have put a little bit more both and in terms of the places that have already been in trouble for a, a long time. Um, because in the both and, you, you absolutely, whether it's to uh, strengthen people's capacity to get out or whether it's to strengthen their ability to stay in a healthy community, uh, we have to be thinking holistically, both within uh, a neighborhood and simultaneously in the region. And indeed, about the national policy beyond the issues of whatever we call it, community development, these issues of, of, of uh, income. Uh, and I would add to that, uh, again, uh, an area that, that perhaps is not dealt with or addressed fully enough uh, in the book uh, is this is also a question of race. Right. Uh, and uh, the people who are in inner city uh, neighborhoods are disproportionately people of color. African American uh, and uh, Latino or Hispanic, uh, and uh, we've got to be honest about that in terms of what it is that that uh, has, uh, with reference to our attitudes about race in this country, uh, and gender also, because uh, the 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 people who are stuck in the low wage jobs are disproportionately single moms. Uh, and, and you need to open up that discussion, what is that about? But the economics of it are absolutely clear. Once you're there with only one person to send out to work uh, in, in uh, this uh, sort of modern low wage economy, uh, it's your, you're very likely to, to be either uh, in poverty with a job or very close to it. Uh, so the terminology has to get to all of, all of these uh, things and so much sim uh, simplifying, oversimplifying, you know, the, the whole question of what's happened to family structure in this country. Okay, well, it's also what happened to family structure in the world. Uh, it cuts across uh, racial lines and nonetheless, so many people think of it racially and yet there are disproportionate numbers that we absolutely have to be honest about. Uh, and some of them have to do with family formation at the beginning, and some of them have to do with what the criminal justice does along the system does uh, along the way. But we, we get these simplistic answers. Well, why don't they just get married? Uh, and, you know, do a little bit more. Well, there should be responsible fatherhood. Well, wait a minute. You know, l let's get down to what's really going on. This is part of the answer. This is part of the subject. Um, so. Peter, I expect a, a blog post on our website. Yeah. Alan? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. I, I apologize to sort of keep coming back to this, you know, one anecdote about East Bay, California, but I think it illustrates the, you know, how these issues get intertwined, you know, in a regional context wherein, you know, the, the families who, many of the families who are there, uh, they were the beneficiaries, so to speak, of mobility policies, right? So they were families who wanted to get out of inner city Oakland and inner city Richmond, you know, get to a safer place, get to what they believe would be a, a nicer neighborhood, maybe a slightly better school for their kids. Uh, but when they got to the other side and, and things sort of fell apart, uh, not only are they possibly no better off, they might actually be a little bit worse off than they were in that original community, which is not to say they don't believe in the power of mobility policies and choice for families, but the public policy um, has not uh, been intentional about moving families to communities with real opportunities. It's just sort of given people a voucher and sort of said good luck. Uh, and we haven't, it, it's, I think it also points to the lack of this quarterback and this integration at the scale where we need it. Yeah, you can have 
you know, one uh, agency at the local level that's trying to pull these services together. But if Eastern Contra Costa County Housing Authority is not talking with the Oakland Housing Authority or the Richmond Housing Authority, these are, you know, these are just poor families who are getting bounced around a region without attention to what they need in terms of skills training, what their kids need in terms of a good school, what they need in terms of uh, safe and high quality housing. Um, so again, I, I just think scale really matters for getting this right for families. Scale at the scale of the economy, the scale of what, you know, in the end, the, the, the best antidote to poverty is getting a job. Um, and I think we have to reconceptualize what we mean by community when we talk about community development if we're really serious about the economy as the best pathway out of poverty for families. Sarah, you, uh, you want to come on either on the general economic issue or I know the Urban Institute has done an awful lot of work on mobility uh, and comment on some of that, that work? Well, so a couple thoughts. I mean, uh, give an example of, of some of the work that we've done on mobility and what we find, of course, is that when people are moved, you make very significant, we're given the opportunity to move into other communities, they have very significant improvements in one facet of their lives. The quality of their physical environment, in many cases their physical security, but there are other barriers to the ultimate outcomes that we've thought about. If the ultimate outcome is um, income, or if the ultimate outcome is health, uh, well, it turns out there are other, part, other systemic barriers to them achieving that movement alone is not sufficient to deal with. And so I think one of the things that we have to think about, and I, I keep coming back to um, uh, measuring and making these policies be um, uh, data-driven, and it seems to me the hard part is that each of these different silos is working against a different measure of success. Uh, if you're, how many people do you move? Are they in uh, units that are in uh, meet building quality standards is a different measure than how many people are served with a different kind of health outcome, um, et cetera. And so what we have to figure out is can we get together around a shared set of goals and we're delivering all of these services around what we think are ultimately ultimate progress and then people at different levels are coordinating. Now, um, Jack Shokoff yesterday made a very good point which is it's not just shared goals but it's also some shared knowledge base because people in these different systems know, you know, one set of people know health issues and another set of people know job training and employment and another set of people know something about housing or education. And, and they don't know each other's worlds well enough to be able to figure out where the uh, opportunity is for the breakthrough collaborative. So um, I do think it, part of the challenge here is about measurement and getting to a shared set of measures and the groups you coordinate around those shared measures sometimes. Some of them will, there, there needs to be a very strong community voice, but to the points that um, both Alan and Peter have made, um, you can't going to solve these problems within the four corners of the community, so you need other people in that process um, besides just community residents right. and voices. Great. So we've got um, some questions from uh, the audience and also from uh, the Twitter feed. I don't know whether internal or external. Um, I will start with the classic Washington question here. Um, if community development works, why is poverty at a record level? Is this evidence of public sector failure? Would the private sector do better? <laughs> okay. Alan, why don't you start? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, this is a false dichotomy. I mean, so much of what community development is, is the private sector, right? It's the notion of leveraging private capital to address market failures that affect places and limit economic opportunity for individuals. So I mean, I think without any public sector intervention, I mean, the fact that there is a market failure there <laughs> suggests that private uh, capital alone is not going to be sufficient to address some of the barriers that uh, these communities face in connecting to, to wider economic opportunities. Is the, you know, existence of, I mean, what I talk about in my chapter, is the existence of poverty at, you know, higher levels today than in 1965 evidence that community development has not worked? That's kind of an unfair barometer. Jesus said we'll always have the poor with us, so you know, the, the, here we are. Um, the, the, what I think, what I, I, I think Peter laid out really well what community development has achieved and, and I think where it's fallen short. Uh, and the fact that, uh, as I say in my chapter two, the, that you know, what we've spent on community development, the effort we've put forth, the places it is and it isn't, 
it's, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a knife in a gunfight against the global economy. Um, so I, again, I think this goes back to what we're talking about, what, what's the right scale for this? What's the, what are the right sorts of activities for community development to focus on? So, it's, so it really is wrestling uh, more intentionally with the, the forces at work that are outside the community that in the end uh, either circumscribe or uh, advance opportunity for the, the people in those places. But can I encourage that we embrace one aspect of the spirit of that comment, which is the notion that we bring the private sector to bear on parts of this challenge beyond uh, the bricks and mortar right. elements, which is what we have traditionally done, and we've gotten very good at in organizations like LIF and others. Uh, have ha, The whole CDFI industry got very good at financing housing and then um, uh, other kinds of um, retail facilities in communities. But the real question is, can we leverage private capital to make change in the outcomes in health and in the outcomes in employment and in the outcomes in the delivery of social services? And there the, if you will, the plumbing of that system to say is nascent is to be generous <laughs> to it. Um, and I think that's a really exciting opportunity for us to figure out how we can uh, bring the discipline and the focus on outcomes that the private sector brings to help drive us to more powerful change. Great. Um, I want to uh, first remind everybody, if we don't get to your question, um, that gives you an opportunity to blog on our website. <laughs> and um, we will actually try to answer some of these questions um, on the website ourselves, but we also hope that um, some of those answers will spark further conversations. Um, I got a couple of questions on, the, on um, okay, so this quarterback thing, sounds good, but how do we, uh, what kind of skills do those people need, and how do we uh, get the funding, um, get the, the strategies to build those skills, and um, also, frankly, figure out what works and what doesn't, um, even among quarterbacks. Um, anyone want to try that, Sarah? Well, so a couple thoughts on it. Um, uh, how we fund it, it seems to me there are two places. Um, this is a very much, this idea of a quarterback role is very much the kind of thing that uh, the focus on innovation that the administration has been trying to trigger and its I3 and education and other things has been doing. So I hope and encourage uh, government not to be ultimately to be able to finance all quarterbacks, but to be able to test a few models of quarterbacking. And I hope we'll see some interest in that. Uh, I'm certainly trying. Um, uh, but I also think this is the real role for philanthropy in the near term, is to try some different models and to set the models up with some kind of what I would call 21st century form of um, uh, uh, evaluation support, research, and data so that we are coming up with a framework to know whether it's working when we're putting these things together. And I would argue that philanthropy has to be uh, play a key role in that. I do think we can look to non-traditional sources of philanthropy, however, because I think a business interest in communities should have a real stake in this working, and there may be ways that we can leverage them as well. So just to build on that, I think what, what Sarah is highlighting is a, you know, a key capacity the quarterbacks need is the ability to blend funding from different sources, government, private, philanthropic, you know, stay ahead of, accountable to all those different sources. Um, and then where they see new opportunities uh, and new challenges in their communities, move resources in that direction. Uh, and, uh, you know, and ultimately, right, be the, be the innovators in their communities, take advantage of their, of their scale and their diverse portfolio uh, to address new needs in ways that, that, that continue to attract investment and keep them ahead of the game. This is a commercial for the next panel. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, I have a special question for you. Okay. So let me ask you this question, which was, um, uh, I think is really important. Um, your sixth point concerning behavioral and, and single unmarried parenting as a factor is true. What can be done? Can we use the bully pulpit of the government to change behavior? Uh, for example, what we did with smoking, we changed behavior significantly. And I would add to the question, or is something more needed? Yeah, something more is needed. Want to tell us about <laughs> it? <laughs> Uh, let me just say a sentence on the quarterback that was implicit in what you said. It's got to come organically out of the community. It could be uh, 
school-based. It could be somebody who's doing community development in a, in a uh, sort of physical facility. It could be from the health side. But uh, uh, one of the things that we did wrong with the empowerment zones, you probably don't even remember the empowerment <laughs> zones, but um, was we imposed a structure on the community, and, and it was, it was uh, just doomed. Um, but can I just say that mm. if we do let it come organically, we need to support them, which means we need to create oh, yeah. networks of learning between quarterbacks absolutely. that it won't other, otherwise people won't yeah. get the benefit. No, a absolutely. Thank you on that. I mean, I completely agree, of course. Um, well, this, this is, uh, I think, the toughest thing. I mean, we, we have now, uh, going back uh, really decades uh, into the 70s, where we let these things sort of <laughs> Fester from one generation to the next, and government messages, uh, yeah, well, but but I don't think that's got a lot to do with it. I mean, I wouldn't send send bad bad messages. Um, this this is this is a combination of finding ways, and it's why I was just in an immediate way so encouraged by my visit out to Ward Seven uh, the other day. Is uh, in a microcosm, they certainly really get it. Um, and it's, it's breaking in uh, to the cycle. It's, it's uh, number one, uh, obviously there are messages and the campaigns against teen pregnancy have done this pretty well. Uh, all, and, and the numbers are going down, although not, not nearly enough. Although I think those messages are much more local than they are national in terms of their possible effect. Uh, and the more they can come from people that young people would listen to, uh, and not necessarily in a media uh, kind of impersonal way, all of that. But y you have to be talking uh, a a about, uh, you know, parents who frankly don't know anything about being a parent and there's a baby comes into the world and how do we reach that in a way that's not condescending, uh, that's respectful uh, and, and uh, that's, that's helpful and we have models. Uh, that, that exists in, in, in home visiting and, and but then on through what what how do we make uh, child care uh, it's more expensive to, to be sure that it's developmental but to the uh, to the maximum extent and so kids are prepared for school and and then they go to schools that teach them right uh, but at the same time, if, if, they're com if they're coming from homes where there's violence in the home, uh, where there uh, is nobody's reading to the kids, I mean, we all know all of these things, it's, it, it, it's an uphill fight and maybe a losing fight mm -hmm. in terms of what's going to happen uh, in school. So, uh, but it is true that we have uh, experiences that are evaluated. We do have evidence-based things that we can do, um, and, and uh, we just, th that's just such a key part to doing it, but it's, it's way, way more than messages. And uh, let me say one more thing, which is I, I don't think uh, we have, or I, let me put it a different way, I do think that in, in so many of these inner city neighborhoods, we don't have the activated civic and community leadership that would provide uh, those, those kind of uh, insertion of, of caring adults uh, in, a, in a constructive way uh, into the functioning of, of the family. And I say all that with extreme care, because uh, it, it's, not, it's not simple to do it. But I, I do think that uh, there are some issues about the responsibility with, within those communities. Uh, to fight back, you know, Elijah Anderson called it the war between the decent and the street. Um, so I will just say I'm not going to ask these folks the grand economy question, um, which, I, which we've gotten a couple of times and I think is really important and we can, we can actually have a good conversation about it on the, on the, the blog, but in essence the question is, um, so Several of you have said that the big issue is improving incomes, having good jobs, uh, making the economy work better. How do we do that? Um, it's too big for right now. But we've heard you, and, and we will um, try to make sure that we, we get a good conversation going on the blog. I, I will end with um, a question that I think is really important. 
Um, and it says, um, two groups we haven't discussed, uh, seniors and veterans. Um, both uh, seniors' needs are, are very different than they were um, 10 to 20 years ago. Um, veterans, whether or not they've been in, in uh, and particularly those who've been in combat zones, uh, have uh, suffered severely uh, and, and are not uh, as, as vibrant a part of the economy as they ought to be. Uh, what, what do we, how does what we're talking about um, work for these two groups? Anyone wanna? Let me just make an observation which is not um, an answer, it's, but it's an observation. Um, those are two groups with different sets of needs. It's a more complicated part of thinking about the delivery systems. But they are also um, two sources, I, I, I'm connecting it to Peter's last point, about what's not present in communities. They're two sources of uh, contribution to some of these problems as well as uh, having their own needs. They are, uh, in many cases, coming back with more skills um, uh, to, that can be, play a role, that there are people at a different stage in life who may be helpful in some of the family. That's not always the case. I understand some of these are stressed populations, too. But um, I think we should think about seniors and veterans as both a communities that need to be well served by these integrated uh, remedies and also an asset as part of those, the remedies in those communities. And I, I mean, I can just highlight a, a statistic from my chapter, which is that actually uh, seniors are a much smaller share of the poor today because we've done such a, uh, I think, an excellent job through public policy of supporting incomes for seniors through subsidized medical care, through social security. Um, the, the bulk of our issue with the poor today is the, is the working age population. So again, it's not to, not to dismiss the, the needs of seniors, and in fact, uh, given the fact that uh, the boomers are becoming seniors now and they were the first suburban generation, many of these folks are in the sorts of communities that I was highlighting in my comments, but you know, the, the fiscal cliff and the, the debt and deficit discussions in front of us today in Washington and what in the end is essentially a trade-off between the old and the young, uh, I don't think we're remiss in, uh, in the community development context uh, keeping, our focus, keeping our focus on the young because uh, you know, as Peter's work and his comments have pointed out, in many cases we're talking about an intergenerational strategy here and if it becomes about these people versus these people, you know, I don't think we're actually ever gonna get at the real issue. Seniors have a role to play. This is a place conversation we're having, uh, although we're saying that it's more complicated than, than a particular place. It's, and seniors have a great role to play uh, within communities. And of course, in many cases, they are. Grandma is raising the kids uh, rather often. Uh, let me just say one other thing. I didn't talk about the young men in answer to your previous question. So let me just uh, add that we have to particularly uh, talk about that, and, and we, we obviously just can't put it off to reforming the criminal justice system. This is also about the individual effort uh, to, to, for young men to see what, that there are possibilities for them that are positive, and that gets into a whole conversation about those uh, care, caring adults, about how the schools function and so on. But I, I can't not say that, uh, not omit, the very great importance of talking about both young men and young women in, in that question that you asked me. Okay, well that wraps up this panel. Um, thank you very much. It's been really a terrific panel and we appreciate you being here. And thank you for your questions.